is I've been thinking about this for a while. There, there's a gentleman by the name of, uh, his, he goes by Mr. Money Mustache. That's his website's name, right? Mr. Money Mustache, um, which I think is pretty funny. Uh, great, great, great name. Uh, but, you know, I, I read his piece on Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs and uh, there was another piece that, was, that, that kind of was my, somewhat attached to it about stoicism. And this is something that I've been thinking about for a while, right? Like, uh, what, is, what, what does it mean to be stoic? Because I think we have some misconceptions about being stoic or, or what it means to be stoic. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been thinking about it for a lot more um, since about two years ago uh, when I was in Plattsburgh and I did a house show um, with, uh, with Matt Hall, who runs a, a, a very great podcast called Trashburg, um, which, uh, which covers everything, uh, about Plattsburgh, New York. They've, they've basically become like the alternative media in Plattsburgh, New York. Uh, and, uh, that's actually, a, a, a forkful topic, uh, that I want to implement here in the near future. But, uh, anyway, uh, point being myself, Matt Hall, another comic by the name of Andrew Frank, we were all kind of discussing um, re- just society's reactive nature and how reactive we've become. And uh, Matt said something interesting <clears throat> where we were sitting around, it was you know kind of late and we're getting deep into it. And he said, I, I, just, I wish that the left would... Um, would take some of the stoicism from the right, would, would adhere some, uh, something along those lines, right? Basically saying, like, the left leads to learn how to be a little bit more stoic. Now, the misconception with stoicism is that it's this, like, you're just unemotional and, you know, like, you, you, you don't care about feelings or whatever, like, it, you're just kind of like a robot, and it's, you know, you, you stare off into the void when you're thousand mile stare. You know, it's the it's uh, it's what we you know look into the Mad Men world as. You know, it's just you're you're fucking sitting back, reclining your chair with a cigarette in your hand, or drinking the whiskey, and and you're just suppressing all of the the human emotions that you would feel. <laughs> You know, that's what you do. You inhale the cigarette, uh, and then when you exhale it out, you're pushing out all of your feelings, uh, and then you uh, you drink the whiskey to, to sterilize whatever's left. That's what people think stoicism was, right? Uh, the way that I look at it is uh, that it is... Uh, it's reflecting on the moment while still being present. <clears throat> Meaning that when something happens, you don't immediately just kind of, blah, like go, you know, you kind of take it in, be present with what's happening around you and, and kind of let, let it, let it breathe. Um, I, I try to do this in traffic. <laughs> Where I, where I feel like that's like the place that we're the most reactive uh, in our society. Whether you're fucking liberal, conservative, progressive, whatever, right? I think everybody when they're sitting in traffic gets all pissy. Anybody dealing with traffic uh, will get all pissy. I'll, I, I'm about to go through like one of the most traffic-ridden areas in Pittsburgh. And every time, every time without fail... Uh, I will sit in the car, somebody will fucking cut me off, and I'll, it's just, motherfucker, why would you do something? What the fuck is wrong? Like, and it's just, you know, instead of being like, okay, well, maybe this person has to, was in a rush, it was a dangerous maneuver, it kind of sucked, they should be a little bit more, you know what, I'm going to be more careful. I'm going to be a little bit more careful now. Um, you know, but stoicism is basically that. It's, it's, it's being in traffic. It's, or my definition of stoicism anyway. Is, is you're in traffic and someone cuts you off and you go, ah, oh, man, that's what a rude thing to do. What a dangerous maneuver to do. And kind of running the course of like, okay, I'm still present. I'm still being careful. That was really rude and dangerous and sucked in a lot of different ways. 
Um, but I wonder why they did that. Wonder why they did that uh, instead of the you know motherfucking them to uh, to all eternity and all hell. Uh, so let's see if I'm right. I don't know. I could be wrong. I could be completely wrong about stoicism. So, uh, Mr. Money Mustache, uh, on his blog, I got, I goddamn love that name. Uh, it's just so funny to me. It's so funny. Uh, he calls it, um, a mental technique is what, uh, the, the old MM refers it to. Uh, he calls it a mental technique to decrease negativity and celebrate joy. Which, if that kind of sounds familiar, I feel like it's kind of the thing that the Jedi's preach. Uh, is is like you want to you want to decrease your negativity and celebrate the joy. You want to really what it, what what this is speaking to is um, uh, positive psychology. Back in 2017, I put out an album called Approaching Happiness, and I talk about some of the things. Uh, associated with positive psychology, and uh, and, th- and you know this is you know one of them is 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 to look at what is good in your life, um, accepting the negative and and concentrating on you know what this is something that's really good. I, the bills you're piling up and that really sucks, and I'm having a really tough time. But but you know I got some friends that took me out and bought me a couple drinks and I had a really good time with them it's really nice catching up and and that's what you focus your energy on um, instead of it just kind of saying well the like it it makes it it makes it makes you take an objective look at what is actually happening so so by that definition um, of of stoicism it kind of comes from the world of uh, positive psychology I think and, uh, you know, it is kind of like what the Jedis were talking about in, 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 the, in the prequel trilogies, which a, a controversial statement there. Uh, didn't hate all of them. Revenge of the Sith was pretty decent. Anyway, um, the, the core philosophy behind this is uh, to, to have a good, meaningful life. That's, that's the core philosophy. Um, you know, to overcome instability is what is what he talks about and uh what this means is like you're not chasing desires all the time um you're you're chasing something fulfilling you're 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 trying to find something that's more fulfilling to your life um and you know that it which is kind of an interesting point to all of it uh that that he kind of talks about it this way is i mean i've done that before Right, like I'm not, I'm not somebody that I'm like not a good dater. Do you know? Like I don't know if that makes any sense, but like I don't particularly go on dates all the time, right? Like my mo is to kind of go head first into relationships. Uh, so when I was single, um, what I what what my normal mo would be is like if I found somebody that I very much enjoyed, and I and I quote unquote chased tail. Uh, I never, I never found that to be, I always would get pissed at myself and it wouldn't feel very good. Uh, it, it felt awkward and like dumb. I, I would feel stupid. That's really what it all boils down to is I would feel pretty fucking stupid. I, that's not what is fulfilling. But when, when I would, uh, be a part of, a, of, of a relationship of a good functioning relationship, that's, that was fulfilling to me. Um, that was good having having somebody that you know that cares for you and you care for them kind of that's that's what I'm looking for so uh, you know the chasing desires is like oh man I'm gonna get that one night stand I'm not very good at it and a lot of times um, it, it doesn't I don't know fucking do me any good it doesn't it doesn't uh, it, it's a short-term thing It's that chasing desires thing. It's the same thing of like within comedy, I'm not really chasing fame. I'm chasing, uh, I'm not, I feel like chasing is, is not really a great, uh, great word for this situation, but I'm, I'm, what I'm looking for is 30 to 50 people in any city that I go to, uh, of people that are specifically, you know, came to see me on purpose for, uh, ideally, 
uh, but people that care, people that are open-minded, people that are interested in uh, listening and talking about ideas and philosophy uh, through the lens of comedy. Um, so, and, and that's a very niche kind of observation uh, or, or niche goal in, in terms of like what I want. I'm not, I'm not kind of, uh, I'm not painting with, the, with, with a broad enough brush that I can go and become, you know, on, on television and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm not, I, I don't, I don't really care to be famous. Um, I was talking to my, a friend of mine the other day, uh, and you know, I, uh, recorded Empathy on Sale in Pittsburgh. We had 90 people in that room, which was very fucking cool. Um, and I was super, super appreciative, but it was really, really hard to like talk to people after the show because either everybody like people come up to you I'm trying to grab my 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 merch my email list and everybody's kind of grabbing you and um, you know uh, it was just really hard to make that personal thing with 30 to 50 I know that I could do that I know that I can stand and talk to somebody for 15 minutes and then talk to another person for 15 minutes and then say hey let's go over to that bar uh, and grab a drink and continue this conversation. But it was really, really hard to do that with uh, with that many people. I, I, I just found it, I, I found it personally uh, difficult to do that. And I'm not saying that I'm not gonna play to, uh, you know, 90 people or 100 people or, or, or whatever. Uh, my goal is just, you know, to keep it, to keep it smaller so that, um, so that I can make a connection, so that I can hang out with people and continue the conversation. Um, you know, uh, so, part, and, and part of it is I have that. And that's another thing that he really talks about. Uh, the, the old MM, uh, talks about, uh, wanting things that you already have instead of, uh, things you don't, right? Like you can, and you, it's not like you're, it's not like he's saying don't have goals, don't have things that you're trying to achieve. Um, but be thankful, be appreciative for what you have, right? I think that notion decreases, uh, decreases that negativity, and and now you're celebrating something. Um, so, you know, just because I don't have the greatest computer in the world, uh, like my computer was glitchy yesterday, and, and I was I was pretty annoyed by it, but I was like, you know, I'm still I'm still pretty thankful of of, of this thing. It's it's vastly improved my ability to create content um, faster. It is a pretty cool machine, uh, and and I and I'm I'm glad it's still here, and that kind of helped me calm down, and you know, like still. A lot of frustration dealing with the, you know, computer glitches and shit like that. I definitely cursed at it, like it can fucking hear me. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it was cool. Um, so the other thing he goes on to say is uh, negative visualization. Uh, instead of saying here's what I uh, here's what I would do with a million dollars, say something like uh, here I, I what would I do with ten? And then when you find out you have a thousand, it's like not a big deal. You're you're grateful that you have a thousand, right? So, so it's the notion of being realistic about um, what you need and how you're going to achieve it. I think f using finances in this situation is uh, this negative visualization idea is is uh, is is cool. I think it. I also think it's 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 the right example to use by him um, because uh, because that's the thing where people visualize it all the time. What would I do with a billion dollars, right? I, I did that, uh, and, and I kind of just got, I don't know, frustrated? I don't, I, I don't know. It felt weird doing it. Um, but basically, like, I talked about, oh, what, what would happen if I got uh, $100,000 for, like, a comedy special on Netflix or something? And I had this conversation with a friend of mine, and, you know, it's like, okay, half of those is probably going to go to taxes. I still have 50000 How would I spend that money? Uh, what would I what would I allocate it to? Um, and you know, and I went down the list and and it was it was like, man, I, you know at at the end of it, I, I think I wound up like taking care of a bunch of debts and uh, paying off some stuff and figuring out like what I would need to uh, 
uh, pay bills and things of that sort. And I still ended up having like twelve or thirteen thousand left over in my calculations. But it just kind of—I don't know—I I, I felt a little bummed out because I was like, "Oh man, only if, right?" But you know. But when I go to a show and I make a hundred bucks, it's like, "Oh fucking rad, man! I fucking made a hundred bucks today. That's great. That's awesome. I'm really, really excited that that uh, that I was able to able to make this extra money. And like that's that's how I try to look at it." Um, but trying to like fantasize about what you would do with this grandiose thing and then and then it's like well you don't have that now it's just a fucking fantasy uh you know like you're not staying grounded you're not staying present in the moment and and that can kind of uh that can kind of trigger some negative emotions in like and and i think it i think it funnels into your ego um and it lets your ego kind of drive the conversation, you know. So, so now somebody that does have a million dollars, or does have a hundred thousand dollars, or does have a Netflix special, you know, my ego being funneled through this, you know, negative visualization, this this fantasy that I've come up with for myself, um, and it's not even like a goal that I have for myself. Uh, you know, my ego will funnel and create more negative emotions it will it will create things like resentment it, and uh, um, and more anger and more um, just more hurt feelings um, and you know uh, I don't think anybody needs that I don't think that does a whole lot of good like feeling resentment um, you know I, I again but this doesn't mean that you can't be critical right like you watch a Netflix special and you go uh-huh eh, yeah, it wasn't that great. I know, I know a couple other comics that that are are, you know, in my opinion, better comics than the ones that got on Netflix. Yeah, and I, and, I, and that is a general, that is a statement that I'm willing to make. Is I do know a bunch of comics uh, that are very funny and very talented that don't have Netflix specials, uh, that are much much funnier and more talented, in my opinion, than the uh, than some of the comics that have received Netflix specials. Um, and uh yeah that's all that's what i'll say about that for the moment <laughs> but i'm not trying to i'm not trying to sit there and you know be like where's my fucking special How? and it's like no i'm 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 very happy with with what with the direction uh, that things are moving in uh in terms of comedy for me um, you know, some people are happy doing exactly what they want. Some people want the Netflix special. I'm not saying it's a bad, it's a bad thing. Um, you know, so, but it's just, it's, it's realizing, um, what you have kind of lowering some of your expectations and saying, okay, I don't have a million dollars, but what about 15? If I had 15 right now, I could, you know, get a get a fucking sandwich from Panera Bread or what or whatever right uh and then you check your bank account and you have like $80 and you're like holy shit I can buy like you know fucking six sandwiches <laughs> from Panera Bread <laughs> nobody should eat six Panera Bread sandwiches in one sitting by the way don't fucking do it don't fucking do it it's a bad idea <laughs> not that uh, Panera's fine uh, it, it, it's basically like mildly okay fast food. Um, yeah, that's that's all I can say about Panera Bread. <laughs> uh, so the old MM continues uh, eliminating uh, worry that it, 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 worry uh, that's out of your hands. Right, you can't control uh, you can't con- control what you can't control. Uh, which I know sounds like a very like weird fucking Yoda thing to say, um, but you can't control other people's actions. So stop worrying about what other people are going to do. Um, you can only control your actions. You can only control how you feel. Um, that's super important because I think uh, I get that way. Like I, I'll I'll send a message or an email or a response, and then I get annoyed that I don't hear back. And it's just like fucking hit me back, you know. Like or you know how hard. And then I get in my head and I get upset. And it's like how fucking hard is it to just say, hey, 
busy. Can I like hit you up a little later? And it's like, yeah, cool. But you can't control that. That's, that's not, you don't decide what this other person um, does in regards to that, but you can control how you react to it, right? So if you know that this person is not going to respond to you right away, just fucking chill out about it. It's that that's just what they are. Why are you getting yourself in a in a fucking tizzy, right? I think politically speaking, people get into this. Like we can't control what Trump or Pompeo or uh, uh, or, or John Bolton or any of these fucking people will do, right? They're gonna do what they're gonna do. Uh, what we can do is how we react to it. Uh, organize a rally, go to a protest, talk about it, right? Uh, ed- educate people about the the history of the CIA, the history of how the Trump administration is being used and how it's no different than, uh, you know, w- the, the wars at the Obama administration, the both the Bush administrations, the Clinton administration, the fucking Nixon and Reagan administration have been doing. Like, this is all a consecutive series of events and sh- it's not really a surprise. I know it's upsetting, but, you know, like, that's, that's a way that you can kind of go about it. Um, that, that's an option. That's how I choose to look at it. Because I think when you realize that you can't control people's actions and they're going to do some, like, large fucking, you know, terrible thing, like start a war with a country that you don't need to start a war with, uh, just because you have a fucking chip on your shoulder, uh, that it was a failed CIA coup and you never was really able to control that country or get all their oil, uh, when, (laughs) when you get to that point and you're like, fuck, I don't know what to do, like, these assholes are, these guys are gonna fucking, you know, uh, you can't stop them in in the sense that uh, you can't like control their their actions or their you know what what they're gonna say or whatever. But you can do something else. It's not too big. Um, you can you can talk to your friends, show them some fucking anti-war videos, show them some shit from. Uh, you know, show them an episode of Redacted Tonight or the Jimmy Dore Show or Act Out or introduce them to the Gray Zone and Aaron Mate's work and Anya Parampil and fucking Abby Martin. Like, show, you know, and be like, hey, this is some interesting stuff, right? Now that we know this, like, you don't have to be in support of politicians um, and, and legislators that believe in this stuff, that, that are, that are uh, kind of selling you down the river here. Um, so, you know, we can control our own actions. We can kind of guide ourselves in saying, okay, I don't know if I can stop this person from starting a war, but I can engage my community. Um, this one is a little weird. Uh, voluntary discomfort. So basically what he says is, uh, uh, he has a quote uh, where he says, the more pleasures a man captures, the more masters he will have. Uh, which I think is interesting. Um, I don't know if I particularly believe in it, right? But the idea behind this voluntary discomfort is is uh, put yourself in an uncomfortable situation. Put yourself in a, in a situation that um, you are not equipped to deal with on purpose. So you figure out how to deal with it. Uh, I can see value in it. I've definitely done that in my comedy career for sure. <laughs> I took a gig at a, at a fucking casino once. Um, casino gigs are, are weird in and of themselves. Uh, but I was also in rural Maryland. Right, right, like Maryland, West Virginia border, that area. Uh, in a casino, 289 tickets got sold. Um, had nothing to do with the fact that uh, my name was on that bill. It had everything to do with the fact that they said that it, it was a comedy show and just a general idea of comedy is what these people came to see. Uh, if you're familiar with my work, <laughs> I am not the general idea of comedy. <laughs> not that, Again, not that there's anything wrong with the general idea of comedy. It's just not what I do. Um, and I kind of knew that when, the, when this gig was offered to me, I was going to headline that show, so I was going to do uh, 50 to 60 minutes, that's that's what was requested of me to do. And uh, I was going to get a free hotel room and $40 in a meal ticket, plus I was getting paid. Uh, so I was like, okay, let's, 
let's see what let's see what I can do here. And I I took my friend Zach Funk to open for me. Another very funny, intelligent comedian. And uh, and we went, we did the gig. Zach got Zach got some giggles. I got some giggles. There was one point where Zach like it was just this uproar of laughter. Uh, and he has a great joke about how he say he has super long hair and he's a nerdy guy and uh, and and you know he's got this satchel that he carries that looks like a purse and uh, basically somebody cat called him uh, and 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 you know uh, I'm not doing the joke any fucking justice here but it's what he says in the cat call that got you know uh, because the word asshole is in it everybody was like oh my god that's fucking hilarious. You know, I'm standing in the back of the room. Okay. Let's find out how this goes. <laughs> 115 people walked out of that show. 115 people walked out. And the way I kind of handled it was just every time that I would keep talking to them and I would see, you know, a majority of the people kind of getting upset. Um, at the topics that I was talking about, because this was during a very, very early version of Empathy on Sale, I kind of kept apologizing and justifying my actions. Like, I put myself in this situation to see if I could, like, grab people that I know are not going to politically line up with me or particularly care about the things that I'm talking about, and I wanted to see if I could get them to care. And it was very evident, I don't think I was going to fucking do that. I don't think that they were going to care. Because I don't think they believe that I go through any of the same struggles as they do. Um, So, you know, just kind of keep your distance and be superficial about your material kind of thing. And, you know, I kept justifying what I was doing as this material, this is about us. I just kept saying that this is about us. Uh, the show is not about us versus, it's, it's about all of us. It's about every single one of us in this room. Uh, you know, like we all need to come together kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, it was a difficult show. Uh, and then I got a fucking message from this dude that was basically like, uh, hey, you, I was one of the few people that stayed to the end of your show too much material about race and religion not funny you should learn how to do comedy for adults that work uh it was like what (laughs) cause you guys know how like children are always talking about the downfall of late stage capitalism and the wealth gap in America caused by corporatism uh, and the and the culture of excess and the greed that constantly surrounds our society you know how kindergartners are just fucking you know, spouting that shit out. They're all, they're all, they're all rocking out on fucking Dr. Richard Wolf, the Marxist economist. You know, they're all, they're all preaching about middle out economic. And they're all talking about how Bezos is fucking every. You guys know, you guys know kids. You guys know how they are, and then they grow up to be good centrists. <laughs> but that's <laughs> that's kind of what this dude was talking about, right? But I put myself in that situation to see if I could do it. Uh, Would I do it again? I don't know. Um, Maybe. It's, I I just, I want to be able to do my show most times. I like my material. (laughs) I know how to not, right? Like I have, I have backup options of like, okay, this is not working. And I, and I don't want to, you know, start shit up for the venue. I don't want to make people uncomfortable I guess uh, or I just don't, I don't want the venue to get in trouble because that's something that can happen is that people can get all fickle and uh, and then the venue gets in trouble and they're like oh I want a refund of my tickets or um, I uh, feel like you should give me free drinks because this person has offended me or whatever um, so you know I, I can switch it up a little bit here and there uh, but that was that was sort of the uncomfortable thing of that situation is I could have done that, uh, but I really wanted to see if I could like make this material work in a, in a setting that I know it's not it's not supposed to work in. Um, 
you know? So you put yourself in these uncomfortable situations. You figure out, you know, how to handle it. You figure out how to, uh, how to react and, and, and better equip yourself uh, to deal with stressful situations or uh, less than ideal situations. Um, you know, so I think that's sort of the point of it. It's hard, man, because I kind of look at it and I go, well, you know, I've been through discomfort, I, voluntary or otherwise, mo- mostly because, like, that, that's just what the situation became. I've, I've stayed in very uncomfortable settings, um, you know, on the road. I've done uncomfortable shows. I've done shows that I'm not excited about because I know that it's going to be a nightmare and a shit show. Uh, I don't know. After a certain point, you kind of get tired and you're just like, eh, I'm tired of fighting. I I, I want to do a show where I I can go in and I know it's going to be a good time. Um, You know, that I know that there's people that are going to come out to see me. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's, it's working out a different muscle, right? I mean, that's what lifting is too, is, is you're putting your body in a state of voluntary stress to increase your, increase your strength. So it can make you stronger as a comic. I, I, in fact, I, I do think that as a comedian or, or just in general, like if you put yourself in situations that you are uncomfortable with and get through it, I do think that it does make you stronger as a person. Now, do you need to constantly keep doing that? Um, I don't know. I think I, probably not because eventually the, the, the returns are not going to be that good. So, uh, you know, I, 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 think, uh, I think eventually it starts to become pointless. <laughs> you know, like constantly putting yourself in uncomfortable situations, that's going to that's gonna put you in a negative mindset a lot more it's gonna it's not decreasing your negativity um that's purposely increasing your negativity um so i i I mean that that's one of those things where i think you have to do it in um in moderation uh so then he kind of goes on to talk about rewards and social interactions uh and genuine connections that's that's what people like I, I am, to some respect, a people person, so I do like those genuine interactions. Like, I always say that if people don't hang out after a show to just chat and get a drink or whatever. Uh, even if it's just, like, with the comics that are on the show, uh, I feel like I failed. Like, if people don't want to fucking hang out after a show, it's just like, what the fuck is that? I, I fucked up. I didn't make the show interesting. I didn't deliver it properly, maybe. Um, it didn't seem like people gave a shit. So... Uh, but that's but that's just me. I think I I, I value the per- people interaction, but I also like value this. I value my alone time in the car talking to a camera. <laughs> no, I do genuinely value my alone time. I, I do. I I like it. I like being alone. Uh, but I'm alone a lot. So eventually, like, I need people to like reinvigorate me. You know, have a conversation with and bounce ideas off of, see friends, catch up with them and stuff like that. So, you know, there, there is value in that sort of stuff. Um, he goes, he basically goes on, I, I agree with him on this point, is fame and social status are illogical. Uh, you can't make genuine connections with fame. Like, I was talking about it earlier, right? Like, 90 people in a room, fucking awesome. What, 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 a, what a big success. Like, that was such a major milestone for me. Like, I didn't think that was going to happen. Um, and I was super fucking thankful that it did. Uh, but very difficult to make those genuine connections. Um, even the people that I was friends with that came to the show that hadn't seen me in like a year in Pittsburgh, hadn't seen a show of mine in a year in Pittsburgh, they came out. And I like, it was like, oh, hey, good job. Oh, thanks so much for coming. Oh my God, I'm so glad you went to blah, blah, And then it was, and then we were just moving on to the other thing because I was getting pulled in all these different directions. Now, I don't think famous people are particularly dealing with that stuff. I have seen a couple of famous bands and I've never, I've never seen them, right? But like, it is this kind of superficial thing because we think we know these people and we do have like affections toward them, right? Like I definitely have 
famous people that I'm, I get giddy over just like in talking about it. Uh, you know, Dave Grohl, Tom Holland, uh, Rosario Dawson's pretty fucking cool. Uh, you know, Shaylee Woodley wrote me a note once. That's pretty, I don't think she knows who the fuck I am. <laughs> it's ever fucking met me. Uh, but I was subletting an apartment from a friend and I was out of town and she was in town and that and she ended up like crashing at the place because she needed a place to crash and she wrote thank you to me and I was like I don't fucking do anything you know so it's like you kind of you 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 see these things and you and you make these connections but but it's 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 not a lot of the things in terms of fame are not genuine it's just too big we we put them on this pedestal um, and you know like uh, what they say, what they do, every little thing is under a microscope, and it, you know that's and and looking for social status and trying to climb up these social ladders, it, it also doesn't make any sense. It also doesn't really um, the the level of social hierarchies that we have in society. I think more or less are used uh, as as you know tools of oppression than they are uh, fucking anything else, and. Um, I don't think I don't think they help you like make genuine connections. I I was never I mean I was the fucking kid that in high school that bounced around from lunch table to lunch table. I never I never sat with one particular group of people. Um, I never you know it, I I wasn't like oh I'm I'm because I I don't know I just never I just never really like fit in just into one group. I also never really wanted to fit into just one group. That was never a thing that I really enjoyed. I liked a lot of different kind of people. So I would go sit with the musicians. I would go sit with the with the burnouts and the band geeks. I'd go hang out with, uh, you know, like sit at, at the lunch table that, uh, you know, all my friends that I see after school were there too and talk about anime and fucking comic books and all that other shit. And I would just bounce around from lunch table to lunch table virtually every single day. And it was fun. Um, you know, and some of the, a lot of these people I still hang out and see, you know, uh, today, which is great. But, you know, I think part of that is also because I, I made those connections in high school. I wasn't popular by any means, but I just like people, I, you know, uh, yeah. It's a big one. Let reason triumph. Let reason triumph. We can't be hyper-reactive. Um, as a society, I think we are hyper-reactive. Something happens and we, and we immediately let the emotion take over instead of letting us figure out what that emotion is and, and what we can do with it. And really thinking about the thing, like we go from, we go from event to react, like that's it. And it's the be all end all. I try not to act out in um, any sort of emotional outburst. Of course it happens. We talked about the traffic thing earlier. I've, I've, I've motherfucked some people in traffic. Um, but like whenever something really truly terrible happens in the news, um, I whatever that initial emotion is, you know, because because it's not. I'm not saying don't feel your emotions. I'm saying those first initial emotions are large and they're powerful, and we don't particularly know how to deal with it. So we should feel them, but reacting and making decisions out of those emotions are uh, probably not the best thing to do. You you have to you have to kind of pull yourself back, right? Let that emotion care, run its course and then come back and be like, okay, now that we're kind of out of the woods of hyper-emotionality, how do we handle this situation? You know, what, what, is, what, is, uh, what is the way that we address gun control in this country? Because there's going to be a lot of people that are going to want to own their gun. There's a very poorly written amendment that people hold on to very dearly. You know, how do we address that? How do we make people see that the, these these are weapons of violence, like, and and kind of go down that path? 
instead of going, oh, if you own a gun, you're you're a, a murderer immediately, right? Like that's not who, 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 what what is that helping? That's not getting rid of the. It's not getting. That's not decreasing gun violence. So, how do we kind of think about it? Right? Is by understanding our emotions, uh, Stoics can bend evolutionary programming and find happiness and purpose. That's a big statement. Um, I think I think reactivity is important in terms of survival, uh, but in terms of like old survival, old old survival. Um, you know, when you when you heard rustling in the woods, when you heard a branch crack, and we were living in the trees, and, you know, a lot of predators around. Uh, yeah, when you heard that shit, and something happened, you have to immediately react, or it could be the end. I don't think we're in that state anymore. We like to. Th- I think we like to think we are. Right? Like, I think we like to think we are. But we're not. We're not in this chronic life or death thing. So I'm not saying... I'm not downplaying um, the importance of specific social justice issues at all. Um, But it's not this sort of evolutionary end of the... end of days kind of thing. Um, So... By, so kind of what he's stating in, in, in a lot of this is sort of a, a, a way of saying, I, I think most of this fits the definition that I have about Stoicism, which is that it's, um, it's absorbing what's going on around you without being reactive, but still being present. Um, not letting yourself be guided by those extreme emotions. Uh, not saying, well, I'm angry, so now I'm going to do... X, Y, Z. It's because now it's just like you're going to, you might, there's a very good chance you're going to fucking regret it. So, being, being stoic, practicing these ideas of stoicism and, and, and really positive psychology more than anything um, and having kind of a grounded look at things yeah, pr- probably will help our society. It'll 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 it, 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 it'll probably help evolve our consciousness and evolve our societal structures uh, and make a happier happier world. I think. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed the contents of this video, uh, please give it a thumbs up and uh, please share it. Share it with your friends, share it with your enemies, share it with whoever you think would enjoy uh, content like this because uh, content like this, anti-establishment content like this uh, that talks about ideas and philosophy that uh, you don't hear on the mainstream doesn't really get shown to a whole lot of people all that often. Uh, So by sharing and by hitting the like, uh, it helps get seen by more people. Um, And please, if you enjoyed this video as well, Uh, subscribe to my channel, subscribe to my page, uh, because I put videos like this up every single week where I talk about sociopolitical issues, uh, philosophy uh, issues, uh, nerd culture, uh, a a, a bunch of different types of stuff. Um, I do uh, various different podcasts from uh, videos like this, which are a little bit more loose, uh, to more structured written videos uh, uh, about current events and bigger ideas on this channel. Uh, So make sure you subscribe, make sure you hit that bell. And if you enjoy videos like this, you might also enjoy my live stand-up comedy. Uh, I'm going to be on tour all across the country. Uh, You can go to my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com to see if I'm coming to your city city near you and grab your tickets. Uh, Over the next couple weeks, I'm going to be in Boston, Massachusetts, Portland, Maine, South Royalton, Vermont, Middlebury, Vermont, Burlington, Vermont, uh, Rochester, New York, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Huntsville, Alabama, uh, Springfield, Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, where else am I? I'm going all over the damn place, you guys. Uh, go check out that calendar. Go get your tickets. Come hang out with me. And uh, I hope to see you guys at a live show. Thank you guys so much for tuning into to this video. And I hope to see you guys again. We'll see you on the road, folks. Thanks again.